Hi, my name is Michelle Glover. I'm the Lab Digital Solutions Specialist at Dentsply Serena Canada. I wanted to show you today the new workflow in Software 20 to design your digital dentures. Uh, essentially in Software 20, we have uh, two workflows within the software to design dentures for milling or printing purposes. Uh, the first workflow that I'm going to show you is called the Denture Tooth Workflow. Uh, and this is where you would basically be able to use the new digital IPN 3D teeth from Dentsply Serona that are portrait inspired. Um, that allow you to work with the carbon workflow with the Lucitone digital print or allows you to actually mill your denture bases in something like the Lucitone 199 uh, and bond in the new digital IPN 3D teeth. Uh, and then the other workflow we will review next uh, in a separate video. But with the denture tooth workflow um, that I'm going to show you today, when you come into the administration, uh, you're going to notice that the administration page looks the exact same. Uh, the only difference now is that you have a icon that has dentures as an option. Um, so this is where we have our two options, denture teeth or individual teeth. So basically the difference being denture teeth, we're working with pre-manufactured teeth, which are, like I mentioned, the digital IPN 3D teeth that are portrait inspired. Uh, whereas the individual tooth workflow, that is identifying to the software that you are actually going to be designing the teeth yourself using the biogeneric function within the in-lab software. Uh, and this will allow you the flexibility to uh, mill or print your teeth. So when it comes to the denture tooth workflow, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to select the icon here for basically uh, highlighting my two odontograms with the uh, arch of teeth. Uh, and you're going to see as soon as I did that on the left hand side here, there's an option that says add try in. So I'm actually able to add two monolithic try ins um, to this case so that in my export phase, I'm not only going to have two denture base files, I'm also going to have two monolithic try in files um, that I'd be able to 3D print um, to try into the patient's mouth. So if I select add try ins here, I'm able to determine what type of material I want to use. So in this case, I'm going to select MCX5 uh, and then Dense Plicerona, and it's going to default to wax. Um, most people would probably uh, 3D print their try-ins nowadays, um, but just as a formality, I'm able to fill in something for the software in order to move forward. Um, but here for my upper and my lower denture bases, I'm going to need to identify uh, what type of tooth molds I want to select here uh, from the portrait-inspired IPN 3D teeth. So once I have my manufacturer, which is Densply Serona, and the tooth line uh, for now is the IPN 3D portrait inspired line, uh, I'm going to basically be able to see from here the anterior teeth uh, first. So what's really nice with the software um, with our IPN 3D teeth is that it's actually pre-configured and pre-occluded libraries uh, that are meant for quick design. So what that actually means is when I choose my upper anterior mold, uh, so let's say I wanted to do 122MP, Basically, it's going to give me, as you saw here, the default uh, lower anterior mold that occludes with it. So it takes a lot of the guesswork out of the actual um, workflow there because I'm able to basically uh, have the best fit solution from occlusion um, kind of opposing my upper anterior mold that I selected. Uh, what's also really nice is when you're working within the uh, in lab software 20 uh, and you choose your IPN 3D tooth mold, uh, if you actually hover over with your cursor, you're actually going to be able to see a full diagram of the actual uh, mold chart itself. So it kind of gives you all the dimensions that you're looking for, kind of from, you know, canine to canine, um, as well as kind of the, the height of uh, the, the teeth as well. So it's a really nice workflow when it comes to kind of taking some of the guesswork out of choosing your mold here. Now, when you do choose your mold here, um, if anything changes when you get to the design aspect, there is the option to actually change the tooth mold right before you finalize the design. So don't worry too, too much if um, you don't get the mold right, you know, on the first try kind of here, because you do have another opportun uh, opportunity in the design phase to actually, of course, um, choose a different mold should you need to. Uh, when it comes to the posteriors, I mean, same rules apply. It is also still those pre-configured, uh, pre-occluded libraries. But first, we have to choose our occlusion. So you have the option to either use uh, balanced uh, of 10 degree over 10 degree, 33 degree over 33 degree, uh, or lingualized occlusion for 33 degree over 10 degree. So you're able to basically choose which one is best for your particular patient. Um, and then from there, same idea with the posteriors. It's going to give you small, medium, and large sets of uh, pre-occluded libraries for upper and lower. So once you have your mold selected, you're basically going to be able to move forward to determine your denture base. 
So when it comes to the machine, again, um, if you are milling in the MCX5, something like the Lucitone 199, you can choose the MCX5 here. Uh, if you're going to be using a third party mill, you all also are able to choose just a five axis 0.6 instrument or an unknown generic device. So sometimes people will choose the unknown generic device if they plan on 3D printing it in something, let's say, like the carbon uh, with the Lucitone digital print resin. So if I'm going to choose the MCX5 here, I'll choose Dense by Serona as the manufacturer and the material I'm going to choose the Lucitone 199. Now, when it comes to mill or sorry to scanning for the dentures, the system basically needs three scans. So the, the scans have already been done for me here, um, but essentially what I have is I've got my upper and my lower jaw scanned in. OK, so typically people are using models, but I actually have seen um, successful scans with uh, wash impressions inside an existing denture. So um, under the scan method, instead of model, um, we chose impression. And basically we were able to use that to capture, um, of course, our jaw itself. Um, but typically most people are going to be using models, of course. So you have your upper and your lower jaw scanned in. And then using the new denture accessory holder, you're basically able to use this holder to hold in place the actual bite registration. So some people are able to create their um, bite reg and what the software is going to do is it's going to scan both the intaglio and the facial surface and it's going to automatically stitch it for you to your models. So it takes a lot of the kind of manual work out of it for you uh, in software 20 and it allows you to have this done um, entirely by the software itself. So a lot of people with wax registrations will of course score um, things like the midline or the occlusal plane just to make the design a little bit easier for them as well. Um, but I also have seen people use existing dentures with maybe a wash impression inside of it to capture the vertical, um, should it still be sufficient from uh, the actual uh, patient's case itself. So that's going to be kind of case to case specific, obviously, uh, depending on uh, the needs of the patient. Um, under the object list here, you're always able to add more scans. So you're never limited to just the three that it defaults to. Um, but the minimal that you do need to create a denture is the upper jaw, lower jaw and bite registration. But you do have the ability to add more scans in as well. So once you have those three scans and you have the check marks to basically tell the software that it's been able to stitch it uh, accurately, you're able to move forward to the model step. So within the model phase, uh, what we're basically able to do, of course, just like in our crown and bridge workflows, we have the edit model step where first we're able to use the form tool if we wanted uh, to basically be able to say add smooth or remove material. So we're of course able to do all those things. So if there were small voids that were actually maybe um, going to affect the fit of the denture or anything like that, I mean, we could use things like the replace tool to actually fill in small uh, holes. So if you know a hole in the model happened, uh, or if there was a small bubble in your impression, you're able to fill those in now with something like the replace tool. I hit apply. And it will, will apply that uh, basically virtual stone essentially to the rest of the model. And then I could do the same thing with my upper model. I'm able to, of course, make any adjustments that I may need to just by selecting it on the bottom of my screen. So there is also the reset model option here. Um, I kind of like to say that this is the Hail Mary tool of if there was too many errors kind of made uh, to the editing, right? So maybe you cut too much out and you know you were, you tried to replace too many things and you just want to bring it back to its original scan. You can hit reset model and apply and it'll bring back your model to its original state. So when it comes to check occlusion, what we're really looking at here is we're looking at the actual um, accuracy of the software being able to stitch together our upper and our lower jaw to our bite registration. So we're almost seeing that kind of marbling effect of the intaglio surface, seeing how the software is able to stitch everything together. So it's a really nice kind of visual aid to see that we've captured our vertical dimensions at this point in time. So when it comes to the set model axis step, uh, I mean, we're pretty used to this from a crown and bridge perspective. So as it pertains to dentures, what we're essentially setting up here is, of course, our two arches within kind of these horseshoe shapes, uh, representing, of course, the upper and the lower jaw, and then everything's broken down into quadrants and sextants. So we're basically able to set up things like our midline, you know, and then basically on the upper left, we have another visual of the, uh, the midline and kind of that occlusal plane in the anterior region. And then, of course, the lower left kind of uh, directly affecting the occlusal plane of our 
uh, posterior region as well. So you're you're going to want to consider things of like the curve of speed and, and such when it comes to uh, designing, of course, your dentures. Um, so this is kind of the point where you want to determine kind of the best fit occlusal plane from, of course, just one straight line. When it comes to the edit denture baseline step, uh, the software will try to propose it for you. Um, sometimes it does an okay job. Sometimes, as you can see here, uh, it can kind of fall off the, the model just a little bit. So if you want to just delete it and restart, you're able to, um, or if you wanted to actually edit it yourself, you can. Um, but basically, you're going to be able to kind of come around your model, go around your freenums if you'd like, uh, or if you want to kind of overextend the border, you're able to do that as well but we're basically marking the margin of our denture base. So we're telling the software exactly where we want this denture base to finish and how deep we want this to go basically into the vestibule for this particular patient case. So often I'll see people who prefer to kind of overextend it because um, then they're always able to adjust, you know, post manufacturing, whether it be a milled base or a printed base. Um, but it's of course easier to do that once you've kind of overextended it as opposed to underextended. Uh, once you have your initial border, you can either choose to edit line um, here to basically, you know, double click to start, single click to tag down the line and double click to finish. Or you also have the drag option where you can physically pull the line out uh, to kind of, you know, overextend that border should you wish to. So you have kind of both options at your disposal. So then I'll choose my upper jaw here, do the same thing. So here the software was able to propose uh, an actual pretty decent proposal here. Very minimal that I would actually adjust, so I actually might leave that um, as is. But um, again, that kind of goes to show you that the software does have pretty intuitive um, capabilities like finding the denture baseline itself, uh, if it can. Obviously, if it's working off of an impression, it might have a little bit harder of a time just because the vestibule might be a little bit more uh, pronounced. Um, but on this, uh, you know, really clean model, obviously, I'm able to see kind of more of that border uh, very visible for the software. The next step is insertion axis and block out. So essentially what we're telling the software here is we're trying to control the insertion axis and we're trying to minimize these undercuts. So essentially what we want to do is we want to make sure that we're not favoring um, kind of, you know, too lingually or buckly with the actual denture itself. So we're going to try to control it with the arrow to, of course, kind of control post manufacturing. How would this be inserted? Right. So we're essentially minimizing the undercuts as best as we can here uh, to determine our best fitting denture possible. So then you can hit apply view direction and that'll kind of lock it in place. And then we do the same thing with the lower. Once we're happy with the view direction, we can hit apply view direction. Um, now there is an option here where it says block out. So if we did want to uh, actually virtually block out any of the undercuts, um, we could, right? So we could of course, you know, change this. And if there was any undercuts that we felt were going to affect the fit, uh, we could always add, smooth, or remove some of the blockout material to this. Um, but it's not an automatic thing. Um, it's only if you wish to add the blockout yourself. So the next step here is the model analysis phase. So basically, these are identifying some key points to the software in terms of, uh, of course, like the ridge itself. Uh, so there's when you hover over basically the, the dot itself, it's got just a very generic kind of, uh, you know, name for where it wants you to place the dot. I personally really like the help tool over here that you can turn on on the right hand side because as soon as you do that, once you actually uh, hover over each model analysis point, it's going to give you not only a diagram, but a full description of kind of where it wants you to actually place each point itself. So this is really helpful, especially when you're kind of first getting used to the software uh, to know where to actually place it. So once you have that selected, you're able to kind of move these dots around in order to, of course, get the best fitting uh, design possible. So this is directly going to affect kind of where the, the software proposes some of your teeth and things like that. So you always want to make sure that you do look to make sure that these are placed in the right position. So then same thing for the uh, upper arch. Basically, I'm able to just select the upper jaw on the bottom here. And same idea, I'm able to go over each point and essentially move any of these analysis points uh, to where I want them to go on the ridge. So from here, there's also an option for the uh, upper 
uh, arch here, uh, where it's edit the labial limiting plane or the distance to the papilla, as it's also known. Um, so this is effect, uh, effectively going to um, affect your lip support for the patient. So it's always important here to make sure that you've either taken the measurement for the patient or that your bite registration has been considered for this uh, key point. So one thing I like to often do is under display objects, if I actually turn on my bite registration, I'm going to make it a little bit more translucent. If my bite registration is actually reflecting, you know, the, the particular lip support I want to provide for this specific, uh, specific case, I can actually use this as a way to determine if that is actually sufficient for the distance to the papilla. So I can always bring this out according to kind of where my buccal um, bite registration sits, right? And I, I find that's a useful trick to kind of, you know, make sure that you have enough lip support for the patient based on the uh, occlusal records that you took with that wax bite. So that's a, a good way to do it. And then of course, if you need to just kind of refine it, you're able to kind of plug in the number. Um, but I find that turning on your bite registration can be really handy for uh, this step. So then from here, once I'm happy with where my analysis points are, I'm able to move forward. So when I come into the design phase, um, very much like with crown and bridge, the first step is always going to be the parameters. So I'm able to set parameters specific to if I'm obviously printing with the carbon workflow uh, or milling with something like the Lucitone 199. So you always wanna make sure you basically look at manufacturer's recommendations for things like the minimal thickness or the pocket spacer. So minimal thickness being of course, the minimal thickness of the denture base itself. Pocket spacer directly affecting um, basically how much space we have for either HIPAA for a mill denture or for the few step uh, one, two, and three with the printed dentures. So it's always important to follow manufacturer's recommendations for uh, these type of parameters. So always double check those before you um, design essentially your case because it's directly going to affect, um, of course, your finishing pro uh, process. So when it comes to adjust morphology, this is essentially the first step in the software where we really feel like we're doing a, a traditional tooth setup. Uh, the fun part is though it's all virtual. So we're essentially setting up our teeth virtually here. Um, so this is our virtual tooth setup where we're basically able to see the molds that we've selected. Now, if this message comes up where it's basically saying that there might be some gaps in the proposal, don't worry too much about that. We're gonna be able to fix that in the positioning phase. What we really wanna look at here is if we're happy with the mold itself, right? So if we're happy with you know, the shape of the teeth, the, the length of the teeth, things like that, that's what our main focus is. I'm not gonna work, worry too much about um, where the position of the teeth are just yet. My focus is just on the actual uh, mold themselves. And if there was anything I wanted to actually change at this point in time. So if there was anything that I wanted to change, I could come over here to the right hand side and basically adjust my molds. Um, always important once you actually do select your mold, um, although the software does recalculate with the new teeth that you have selected, I always uh, recommend you hit recalculate here. So it recalculates the entire arch for you at the same time. OK, so I do recommend that as a step if you are going to change the molds at this point. But this next step, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come into positioning because what I'm going to do is I'm going to take care of any of the gaps that the software mentioned uh, in some of those posterior regions. And what I'm going to do as step one here is I'm going to hit this option here that says harmonic setting. So what it's going to do is it's basically going to regroup the teeth uh, to ensure that it's no longer causing some some gaps or anything like that. So now I can see that the gap that was originally there is now uh, been taken care of. So what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to just make sure that uh, I can move my teeth and reposition them. So I'm going to turn on my bite registration. I'm just going to make this a little bit more translucent here. So if I want to group the teeth together, um, what I would always recommend is if you hold on your shift key on your keyboard, you can actually highlight basically all these teeth. So lower anteriors, upper anteriors, left and right posteriors. I'm grouping them together, but then I'm gonna select this option up here that says linear. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna basically be able to group all the teeth together in order to move them. So if I wanted to move my midline ever so slightly to reflect where that uh, midline was on my, my wax bite, I'm able to do that. I'm just gonna bring my teeth down a little bit here. And then I'm gonna just rotate my model so that I can bring down the posterior teeth as well.
So if I wanted to turn off my byte registration now, I'm able to basically see my two arches here, right? So I can kind of see how they line up. See if I'm happy with everything there. I, I could turn off some of my occlusal plane line here or my medium midline essentially, right? So I can see kind of my midline there, right? So I'm always able to turn on those details, right? So those are effectively, effectively coming from kind of my, where I set my set model axis up with. So I can always change those if I need to go back, but I'm pretty happy with, with that. But if I did want to lift up the teeth just a little bit more, Now, if you did want to remove the second molars, you do have the option in the positioning step to actually add or remove the second molars. So if I had a space issue, I could quickly remove my second molars from my design itself <clears throat> to accommodate, of course, the, the arch requirements too. All right, so once I've removed those molars, if I'm okay with that there, what I'm able to do is essentially move forward to the design step of my uh, dead, uh, edit denture base. But one thing I am able to do here, if I wanted to look at the virtual articulator, I could actually virtually articulate this case and then actually see. So basically these are the parameters that it uses. You are able to plug in parameters specific to your own kind of needs or the, or the patient specific details. Once you hit OK, it's going to virtually articulate the case using these parameters. So that's why you want to make sure that if you are changing the parameters, it reflects either an articulator that you're using or specific parameters that you've used for this patient, um, maybe setting up their wax registration. So at this point in time, once we actually virtually articulate this case, we're essentially then able to exit this. And then we have the manual move option where we're actually able to see all the kind of dynamic functions of this particular case itself. So if I come over here to the right and I come now to manual move, I can actually see all the kind of dynamic functions like the lateral intrusions, protrusions, excursions, things like that. So I can kind of manipulate the lower jaw uh, to kind of see the function for myself. So when it comes to this model here, if I wanted to turn this a certain way, over here there's kind of like this pin index. So I'm able to essentially use this to capture some of those excursions, lateral intrusions, protrusions, things like that. So I'm actually able to see for myself some of the functionality for this particular denture case now, right? So I'm still only looking at the teeth themselves from that perspective, but it's very handy to, to kind of be able to get those ideas. So just to, just to give you an idea of how that virtual articulator can work. And then you can just turn off, of course, the manual move function to get rid of that. But when we come into the edit denture base, the software is, of course, going to propose two uh, upper and lower denture bases. And then what we're going to do is we're going to spend some time using our various tools to actually, you know, make it look pretty. <laughs> Basically do any of the... Um, aesthetics that we want to the denture base itself. It is worth mentioning for, you know, things like stippling and stuff like that. Those type of things with milling a denture can actually add quite a significant amount of time for the processing of the job itself. Um, so that is one thing to consider when it comes to adding in the different details to the denture base is how much time do you want to be spending for the actual uh, production side of it, right? Specifically, if you are milling, right? Because the more detail you put into the denture, the a little bit longer it's going to take from the actual mill perspective. So that's one thing to consider um, at this point in time when you're designing. So some of my favorite tools within the design software, obviously the form tool is a great tool to be able to kind of sculpt, um, you know, around the actual um, kind of embrasures and things like that of the actual tissue itself. So what you'll see is the teeth actually go kind of translucent. That's because the teeth themselves, there's nothing that you're doing from a design perspective to change the teeth because they're already pre-manufactured for you. What we are able to do though is change any of kind of the, the tissue around it. So if I wanted to kind of sculpt these a little bit more, you know, make it less kind of triangular shaped around the papilla, I can kind of use things like the remove tool to kind of sculpt around that tissue.
So that's kind of one of my favorite tools is definitely things like the sculpt tool with the form and remove. So I kind of over exaggerate and over extend initially. And then I kind of go in and fine tune with things like the smooth tool uh, and the add tool. I just want to first get the aesthetics of the actual gingiva portion around the tooth, uh, you know, surrounding the embrasures and things like that, just to make sure I get kind of the result that I'm looking for. And then I can always go in and refine after the fact, but I usually like to kind of overextend it just a little bit here. Any of those areas of blue are suggesting areas of minimal thickness. So always good to kind of get into the habit of filling in kind of some more material there. Um, one thing I do really like about the four directional option under individual is that you can really kind of manipulate the tissue um, in some really cool ways here. So, I mean, sometimes what I like to do is kind of over, again, over exaggerate the tissue at this point, right, to kind of get my festoonies and things like that. And then what I'm able to do is, you know, go in and refine with smooth options, right? So I'm able to kind of fully move around my tissue in four directional movements. And then I can, of course, kind of go in to refine with, of course, my smooth options. The denture base in the finalized phase, really all you're doing is any last minute adjustments. So if there was anything, you know, from their perspective of aesthetics or anything like that that you wanted to fix, you could do that here now. Um, let's say there's a little bit of blue showing where minimal thickness is a concern. Of course, at this point in time, we can kind of thicken up our base and add a little bit more material in there. Now, when it comes to the denture bases and the sockets, of course, the sockets are going to be a little bit thinner in the areas only because you're printing or you're milling them, right? And there's, of course, going to be the bonding agent in them. So don't worry too, too much about the minimal thickness inside the socket. Our main focus is, of course, the denture base itself. Um, but when we move forward to the export phase, here's where we're going to basically have two denture base files with the sockets in place and then two try-in files. So the two try-in files, essentially you're going to be able to send them for 3D printing. Um, and then the bases, you'll be able to either, um, of course, send them for milling in something like the MCX5 uh, or to a third party uh, mill as well, uh, exporting the STL file, of course. Um, but with the CAM software, um, with the InLab MCX5, um, associated with InLab Software 20. It has really great strategies for milling dentures, where it's really able to minimize the undercuts using uh, the tool that's actually called Minimize Undercuts. Um, so it's a really great workflow um, from a milling perspective. Now what we're seeing here is basically the lower denture base with the sockets, okay? And then of course we can look at our upper as well. And then we'll have our two try-in files. So here's our upper base now. And then our try-ins would be at the bottom there as well. So here would be our lower try-in. And then we've of course got our upper try-in as well. So when it comes to the try-ins, um, I mean, typically people are 3D printing them. Um, you do have the ability, of course, to, to send this for milling and, and something like wax. Um, but I would say that most people are commonly 3D printing these items uh, simply because it's going to be quite time consuming in the mill. Um, but when we come to export, you have the option to either export as STL and then, of course, designate where you're going to export them to and in what type of file folder and, of course, what um, platform, right? Um, and then, of course, you also have the ability to export to InLab Cam, which will, of course, designate um, that you are going to be milling these um, in other things like wax for the try-ins or, of course, your Lucitone 199 for your denture base. So that is the InLab Software 20 denture design. 
uh, where you're able to design, of course, with the digital IPN 3D teeth. Um, so that's using the denture tooth workflow. Um, I'll come back for another video um, to discuss the workflow with the individual tooth workflow, uh, workflow, which is where you're basically able to design the teeth yourself uh, to either mill them and then mill the base, uh, which is probably the most commonly used workflow. Um, you do have the ability to export the STLs if you wanted to, uh, to print them in a third party uh, printer with you know different uh, printable materials and resins out there. Um, however, I don't see you know, great results from a uh, wear resistance or fracture resistance or even aesthetic necessarily with printed teeth. So that's just my opinion, but uh, it could be good to, to get into the habit of milling uh, something like uh, PMMA. Thank you so much and we'll chat soon.